But we think we're ideally suited to address this unique mechanism of injury that's occurring with COVID due to high uric acid levels. The opportunity for emergency use approval as, as an opportunity to be marketing a drug in a year's time or so. Dr. Alan Davidoff, CEO of Zortex Therapeutics Inc., now trading on NASDAQ under the symbol XRTX, joins us again. Dr. Davidoff, welcome back. Thank you, James. Thank you to uh, your folks at Midas Letter. Really looking forward to the chat today, and, and it's a pleasure to provide an update. You bet. So um, it has been, Alan, about a year since we last had you on the show, and there's been some real changes in the whole Zortex thing. You're now trading on NASDAQ. You found that you've got some relevance to the COVID-19 pandemic. So why don't we start? Give me an overview of the developments in the company over the last year, please. Yeah, you bet. Well, I think last time we spoke, we were we were in a non-deal roadshow scenario and moving forward uh, with the proposal that we'd raise some additional funds, that we'd move forward, start drug manufacturing, and and really start to get the ball rolling in terms of the basic uh, steps that we needed to take to get to phase three clinical trials. Uh, since the time that we last talked, we have raised that money. We have almost completed the GMP manufacturing of drugs. So that's clinical quality, clinical ready drug for moving ahead. We're preparing regulatory filings. And in the interim, since we've chatted, we wrote some provisional patents around the COVID space. We recognized very early that acute kidney injury may be uh, involving, involved with high uric acid levels, and that may be contributing to not only acute kidney injury, but acute multi-organ injury and possibly even sepsis in that space. Uh, we entered into a partnership with the Mount Sinai Health Network in Network, Network in New York, and uh, the results that are emerging from their work are clear indications that uric acid is involved, that it increases the odds ratio for injury much higher, and we know those acute injuries are closely correlated to mortality. Um, we've also initiated basic work in, in also our polycystic kidney disease program. As, as you mentioned, we've also completed an uplisting along with uh, fundraising associated with that to, for the NASDAQ uh, U.S. securities uplisting. So a lot of things have happened in the last year. And, and you know, the real bonus from that is uh, we've also been able to strengthen our management team, our board of directors, and our clinical advisory board over the course of the last year. So we're well poised to move, move ahead uh, in the next 15 months or so. Sure. So one of the most interesting characteristics of Zortex at this point from an investor's perspective is uh, you've consolidated the stock in such a way to, to achieve your NASDAQ listing, understandable, but it's now a company that's got such a small number of shares out. What's the total number of shares outstanding currently? Uh, 12 million in the float and 18 million all in. Right. So 18 million shares all out for a, a company that is very advanced in its, uh, its evolution of its products. Um, to me, that represents an extraordinary opportunity for investors who are so inclined. Um, and I say that not as an investor at this point, though I do expect to become uh, a shareholder relatively soon here. Um, so that's, that's intriguing to me. And uh, so... In that, you're now traded on NASDAQ. What, uh, what sort of coverage have you got in terms of bringing this story to the institutional and the retail investor realm in the biotech investor space in the United States? Well, great question. You know, I think the, 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 the founding principle here is that uh, NASDAQ uplisting, listing on U.S. securities exchanges is, is always a boost to your liquidity, boost to your access to public markets, um, certainly exposure. And... As you mentioned, and as, as we're very aware of, these late stage clinical trials are often accompanied by partnerships. They're often accompanied by progress that is increasingly de-risked. So as, as we move forward, we are working very diligently on uh, non-deal roadshow visits right now, 
uh, outreach. And, and most recently, this morning, uh, we had a very nice report come out from eResearch uh, on, on Zortex Therapeutics. There are two other analysts writing reports that we expect to see before Christmas time on Zortex, on our late stage clinical trials, both in autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, which is an orphan indication that's, that's largely undertreated, but also in acute kidney injury and secondarily acute uh, organ injury, multi-organ injury in hospitalized COVID patients. So a bright year ahead as far as recognition and analyst coverage and the kinds of roadshow work that we're doing to expose the story not only to the US but European markets as well. Sure. Could you elaborate a bit on the treatment of COVID related injury, organ injury, uh, and how that came about and how your compounds work to treat that? We had um, a reasonable basic understanding that acute kidney injury could involve high uric acid levels. Um, we didn't know the breadth of what was happening in patients with COVID. And as, as the Mount Sinai programs have advanced, uh, this week later on, we published uh, a, a news release showing some of the data that's been released online uh, that implicates uric acid in the acute injury that's happening in kidneys, uh, certainly in the heart. And we believe that there is a, a new indication that's been unmasked uh, with respect to sepsis, where uric acid seems to be driving the kind of sepsis that can lead to a procoagulative state. So the, th the thrombus, the myocardial infarction, kidney infarction, brain, et cetera, stroke um, that's happening with COVID patients. So that indicates that there's an opportunity for patients who are hospitalized to show up with this uh, combination of acute kidney injury, any evidence of acute kidney injury, plus high uric acid in the range where we know we have the tools to treat it. The, the approach is to lower it very rapidly and then maintain it for about a 30 day period and then follow up those patients in clinical trials. We believe that this approach will remove that layer of injury that's happening associated with COVID, but, but specifically due to uric acid levels. So we think we're ideally positioned not only to conduct a, a clinical trial that we're slating as six to seven months to complete, but also to be in a position for emergency use approval uh, after that tr clinical trial is completed. Mm -hmm. So it's a registration trial. Sure. Do you have a sense of what percentage of COVID hospitalizations uh, are uh, suffer a, a injury because of uric acid levels? Yeah, there's some really good fundamental work that's been done. We see that about 50% of individuals who are hospitalized have levels of acute kidney injury where we think they're addressable. What we see at the time of discharge, and there are some very nice papers from this this work, this working group at the at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital Network in New York, showing about 35% of individuals leave hospital with acute kidney injury. Even after 90 days, their acute kidney injury isn't greatly improved. And what that suggests and, and agrees with uh, other work from, from British, British researchers is that there seems to be an emerging chronic kidney disease that's, an, that's novel and an accelerated form, which very likely could be the second leading cause of chronic kidney disease in the future. So we think we can address that, decrease the severity of individuals while they're hospitalized, and that bodes well for quality of life and, and potentially reducing that chronic kidney injury burden that is, that is coming. Mm -hmm. Is there any existent uh, emergency use authorizations for any competing sort of treatment for this condition? Right, well, what we've seen is, is there are three or four drug or therapeutic approaches that work. Obviously, vaccines help people. They protect people over time. And, and um, you know, we encourage everyone to get their vaccines. We have seen very compelling data from a drug called dexamethasone, which is an anti-inflammatory drug. 
it's received emergency use pr approval. We know that uh, Mall Nuva Pier from Merck is poised for treatment again. It's an antiviral, so it's meant to decrease the amount of viral load that individuals see. That looks like for some individuals, a portion of the population who have kidney disease or who have COVID may benefit from it. Those are the obvious ones. Uh, beyond that, uh, we don't see much on the horizon that would be beneficial, although we, we are monitoring on a regular basis. So we think we're ideally suited to address this unique mechanism of injury that's occurring with COVID due to high uric acid levels. Sure. And so uh, I guess in that there's a sort of an urgency to the COVID-19 related conditions, especially um, that this has sort of caused uh, a bit more attention, a, a bit more compressed timeline in terms of the FDA's willingness to sort of advance your studies. Right. I think I think if you have a compelling rationale for a clinical study, the, the road is more permissive to move forward quickly. I think in terms of a viral uh, infection, the treatment period is naturally uh, during the course of that active infection. And, and so for us, the, the rationale is a 30-day approach. Um, if that can help people and improve their quality of life, uh, you know, we see the opportunity for emergency use approval as, as an opportunity to be marketing a drug in a year's time or so. Mm -hmm. Wow, fantastic. Yeah, by the end of 22. Sure. Okay, so then um, your partnership, you, you, you announced the outcome of the study of Mount Sinai back uh, earlier in October. Um, do you have other partnerships, uh, research relationships in the space expected to come to market in 2022? Not in, not to market in 2022. Our lead program is in polycystic kidney disease, where we see uh, an opportunity to do a bridging pharmacokinetic study that would then lead into a phase three registration trial. That's a registration trial that would look to decrease the rate at which filtering capacity declines in patients with uh, moderate to severe polycystic kidney disease and would provide um, an opportunity to perhaps improve quality of life. We think that there are signs within the data that suggests for every year of treatment, we can keep people off of dialysis or off of um, tr the need for transplantation. So that, that from a socioeconomic standpoint is, is a very important milestone for a lot of patients who don't have therapeutic options. There is a single drug approved in the autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease space, Tolvaptin or Genarc. It's in year three of approval of a, of a seven year exclusivity because it's an orphan uh, area. That drug is serving about 5% of the market. So we see our drug as being novelly and ideally situated to be first in class to deal with this mechanism of injury that's happening in polycystic kidney disease. We think that that approval probably is 2025. Interesting. All right, Alan, we're going to leave it there for now. I really appreciate your time for the update. We'll come back to you soon and see what's happening. Thanks for your time today. All right, take care, James. Bye-bye.